Over this convention, I will be introducing the four strikes that took place in 2021 and 2022. These strikes changed the lives of BCTGM brothers and sisters, our BCTGM International, and the whole labor movement. During the COVID-19 pandemic, BCTGM members worked an enormous number of hours and overtime, risking their lives and the, fam and the health of their, of their families. They worked every day to, fill, uh, to feed the country. Our workers were held as heroes and given the title of essential. All the while, the companies they worked for were making record profits. Our union was grappling with change with the passing of President Durkee and the election of new executive officers. We immediately got to work leading this, the union through the pandemic. But we heard frustration and tension rising in our plants and union shops. We understood there would become a breaking point for our members. President Shelton saw a new direction. For years, we have said that BCTGM sells 99% of contracts without a dispute. Although this is true, President Shelton and I feel that this claim gives false sense of confidence to employers that members wouldn't strike. President Shelton sent that directive to our international vice presidents and staff and it was our workers want to strike, it would be their decision. The International would support their efforts 100%. As we talk about the strikes over the next few days, I want you to know that President Shelton has lived up to the commitment to our membership and has shown incredible leadership through each of the challenges he faced. I want you to thank him right now. The international staff was fully engaged in each strike at every level, from the negotiating table, the news media, social networks, the planning rallies of events, and boots on the ground at every single picket line. The full force of this international union was activated. President Shelton helped build relationships to support striking BCTGM members from grassroots activists, organizations to the highest political allies, and even the President of the United States. Right. Under President Shelton's leadership and the tenacity of striking union members across the country, we rose to become one of the most recognizable labor unions in the United States. Most important, our brave and courageous brothers and sisters and the sacrifices they made, risking it all for what they believed in. Not only produced victories for themselves, but for the hundreds of other BCTGM contracts that were settled without union members going on strike. Companies such as Kroger, Fryan's Bakeries, Milkbone, Bimbo Bakeries, and other, and, and other Frito-Lay plants, and other Nabisco plants, and other Kellogg facilities, and other rich product shops, as well as many other employers, came to the bargaining table trying to avoid a strike. The success of the 2021 strikes gave our members across North America leverage at the bargaining table and provided some of the best contracts and achieved in our industries. If your local was one of the local unions that went on strike in 2021, please stand right now so we can give you another round of applause. If you went on strike, if your local on strike, you stand right now. These locals right here, what they did helped all of us. Everybody in the labor movement, everyone in the contracts. So many times I've heard when Kellogg's was on strike, other Kellogg plants were getting the best contracts they ever got because the company didn't want a problem somewhere else. Same thing with Rich Products, same thing with Frito, same thing with John Denaire, which is owned by uh, Rich Products and, and Nabisco. Now I want to introduce the first of four feature strikes, Frito-Lay in Topeka, Kansas. On July 5th, 2021, after more than a year of negotiations, approximately 600 members of BCTGM Local 218 at Frito-Lay in Topeka, Kansas, hit the streets in a fight to, ha to have a voice over how many hours in a week they can be forced to work, fair wage increases, improving safety and health, and other working conditions. The pandemic by this time had taken a toll on our workers. The company continued to run shorthanded and force workers to produce more products and work an extreme number of hours. 
The company was making record profits while our brothers and sisters were risking their lives. And most management were sitting at home, right guys? While we were out there working and slaving. Workers said enough was enough. This strike was about the quality of life for workers and their families. Despite repeated warnings to the management of Frito-Lay over the last decade, decade, employees were forced to work seven days a week, up to 12 hours per shift. Many of the workers were only getting an eight-hour break between shifts. Some were forced to work double and triple shifts. In Topeka, these are called suicide shifts. Local 218 members didn't have time to see their families, do chores around the house, run errands, or even get a healthy night's sleep. This strike was about working people, having a voice in their futures, and taking a stand for their families. I know everyone in this room today who work in our industry can relate to these types of schedules, time away from their families, and the toll that it does on our bodies, especially over the last few years. Am I right? Anybody else work in top schedules? Yeah. That's right. You guys can relate. We know. We all know what happens in factories. We know we have to work those hours. The company even reached out to the IUF, the International Union of Food Workers, whom we have a long-time affiliation. The IUF and its affiliates represent 2.5 million workers in 126 countries. Frito-Lay also has a relationship with the IUF because of the many worker violations and anti-worker actions around the globe. So Frito-Lay reached out to the IUF and asked uh, to, uh, a week into the strike and asked if the IUF would intervene out and, and what would it take to finish the strike to resolve it. Little did they know, the BCTGM had the unwavering support of the IUF, millions of workers around the world, Harry Kaiser now spoke with Sue Longley, which he's going to be speaking on Monday, General Secretary of the IUF, and explained the issues involved in the strike and asked for the IUF to help in sharing President Shelton's press statement, explaining Frito Lake workers' fight for respect and fairness on a global scale. Their commitment to strike was going to be for as long as it takes. This strike with a multi billion dollar global company like Frito Lay started a movement that all workers can relate to in their own jobs. The company lack of appreciation, years of suppressed wages, and outright disrespect of workers as essential. The fight resonated across the country and around the world, and the outpouring of support for our brave union brothers and sisters in Topeka was overwhelming. National AFL-CIO, local and state AFL-CIO central labor councils, and other AFL-CIO international affiliates Community allies, politicians, concerned citizens, and religious and community played a big part in the historic victory. For 20 days, local 218 union members held the strike line until a new collective bargaining agreement was reached that put an end to suicide shifts. It guaranteed one day off a week, can you believe that now? and increases in wages. The workers won. The workers won. Yes. The outcome of this strike is a testament to the tenacity and grit of the Frito-Lay workers in Topeka, Kansas. And today, we salute Local 218 membership who were left with no choice but to strike and defend the livelihoods of themselves and their families. In our next video, you will hear the voices and see it in the faces of the striking members outside the Frito-Lay plant. Please play the video. This is a strike for our lives. We get no days off, 12-hour days, no time with our families, and we get no good pay. We haven't had a race in years. people in this building that's been here for over 25 years and I've been here for 37 and they are still forcing those people and myself 12 hours a day seven days a week they were working for home half of HR couldn't be seen for most of the weeks but we had to be there 12 hours a week seven days a week it's unfair to these people that got kids they got families that live out here it used to be 
be a luxury to work here. But anymore, when you tell people that you work at this place, they just call you a slave. We toured this in fifth grade even. They, they said, hey, you, you can, you'll be happy to work here someday. Of course, that was before all the uh, horrible working conditions and the uh, lack of pay. So you leave at 7 p.m. and they want you back in here at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not fair. We need time with our families. We need time with our children. People that work seven days a week, 12-hour shifts, sometimes they have to pull suicide, which is you're off at 11 a.m., but you have to come back at uh, 7 p.m. When we had the ice storm, we were in here, day in, day out. And all we got was some little lamps filled with kerosene to warm us up, and that didn't do anything in the warehouse. One person already had heat exhaustion, like, within a day, like, of the higher temperatures hitting. And this was at night. Couldn't leave the line, they didn't, no one came for breaks, no one helped him out, management kept it, said you gotta keep this line going and get it back up. They ended up wheeling him out that day. We have gone six full years with nothing. Actually seven, because this is drug out a year. And then they offered us, for this new contract, they offered us a dime the first year, nothing the second year, and a dime the third year. So that would mean we would be going nine years with 20 cents. You know, everything goes up, you know, milk, gas, everything. Our wages aren't going up. We can't survive like this. They are greedy. The CEO is making millions, yet we are making nothing, getting, getting cents in raises. This is not fair. This is not something that we wanted to do. No. This is something that we had to do. Nobody wants to go on strike. Nobody wants to sit out here making a spectacle of ourselves. But we will if we have to. If we want fair wages, if we want to be respected when we walk in the building, if we want the training site of Topeka to be a little bit better, we'll do this as long as we have to. Incredible. Now I'd like to call on Midwest International Vice President Brad Schmidt, uh, who led the negotiating committee through the negotiations with Frito Lay, to say a few words. Brad, will you come on up? see shit up here, can you? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I just got to clarify a couple of things up first. <clears throat> From the Midwest region, which I'm vice president of now, my brothers and sisters, some of them are comedians, and I've heard it from people outside, even outside the region, that who's the fat guy in the suit today, or the coat? I don't wear this stuff. This is not my apparel. But my president, who is uh, a wise, wise person, uh, pointed out to me that this is a special occasion and I should do something a little bit different. So, and I usually do, usually do what I'm told, so thank boss. <laughs> so, it is what it is. Uh, I started Free to Lay in 1972. And in 1973, it's hard to believe, but I became one of the troublemakers. We organized a plant in 73. Uh, I worked at that plant for almost 14 years. And it was actually a decent place to work. We got decent contracts. Uh, then things started to turn. Like in most places, the corporate started doing more things, taking more away and it became a hole to work at instead of a good job. Uh, when I started out there, they used to do things for holidays, they used to do cookouts, and then, you know, they, they actually showed some appreciation for what you did. And then we went into the no cookouts, no celebrations, 
got forced overtime, suicide shifts, complete disrespect for the union workforce. Frito-Lay got greedy and began putting profits before its people and paved the way for the first strike at Frito-Lay since it was organized in 1973. We had people working 84 hours a week, just like in some of your places, no days off, no single day off in six months, including Saturdays, Sundays, working 12-hour shifts, some as little as eight hours off between shifts for return to your plants. This was the one thing that resonated with America when we went on strike and they started hearing our our people's stories. They could relate to what the hell we was going through. And I live in Topeka, Kansas, or a little bit out of there, big Republican state. It's too bad, but it's what it is. I never seen the media. Uh, we, they, you know, we was never, they was never uh, in favor of labor, always put us down. They actually carried the stories, and, and Frito Lay still got a black eye today, PepsiCo, that's who owns them. They're still trying to get this back from what uh, they lost. I've never been more proud of my brothers and sisters. <laughs> Just over a year ago, we walked out July 5th, and I got a call from President Shelton on the July 4th, which was a Sunday. And he said, are you still going on strike on the 5th? I said, yeah. He said, well, hell, the plan ain't running, is it? Because that'd be the, the holiday. And I said, respectfully, you gonna tell them they can't go on strike? Well, no, I said, we're going on strike. So we did, midnight, July 5th, we was out the door. And it was amazing, just the, the you could just feel the, 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 I guess the relief, the people just finally got some, some of this crap off their shoulders. You could just feel the mood getting better. It was like a, a circus to some degree out there in, in front of that plant, which sits off the highway. And uh, the one thing that when they started telling their stories and the media picked it up, I was having calls from different, I'd heard of the agencies, but I don't, I don't talk to nobody. Wanting, to get, you know, wanting stories, what's going on? And it just resonated. The people in the, in the states could f understand what the hell we was going through there, and they, they picked up on it. And the, it was really simple. Just treat us with, with respect that we deserve. We had hundreds of workers, union members, activists throughout Canada that visited the picket line for the 20 days we were out. The struggle stories from our members, and you heard some of them on the video. And I'm glad they edited part of it because there was some pretty lively conversation they had on them videos. Uh, but people could relate to what, they were, what was going on. Uh, and it was amazing to see how the community actually rallied against us, rallied against, for us, excuse me provided incredible support. Other unions, churches, leaders, supporters delivered food, water, cold drinks, dog days in the heat in the summer, Kansas summer, it's hot. R rumor is we even had a, <clears throat> getting a little off script, there's a gentleman's club I hear that's south of the plant. And when they would close it, I think two in the morning, they would, uh, in, where the plant sits at is on the old highway, and they would come down and <coughs> entertain the workers, the strikers, for a few times on their way home. And it, it kind of raised the spirits. You might be able to relate to that. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we had money from literally every corner uh, in, the, in the country to support our striking workers. And we had one woman, don't know her name, from Wisconsin. On a Saturday out there, she sent 12 pieces to the strikers on the, on the picket line. She didn't know us from anybody. But that's the kind of support we had throughout the United States. A lot of you all helped us out, and it was, great, it was greatly appreciated. And the one thing I think with, with Frito-Lay that, that touched the hearts of America to the point it did is what really threw Frito-Lay off their game. They couldn't compete. They got a hell of a black eye uh, from this. And they, they don't have the community support they had at one time. And they got deep pockets. Pepsi Cook got a lot of money, but it wasn't like their commercials where everybody's happy going to picnics and all this crap. It was what really going on in that place of paying for them commercials. Uh, I want to introduce two two people that was uh, was out there on the on the strike on the picket line. First member is Jerry Freed, who was among the first members to hit the picket line. He worked that day. He already had an eight-hour shift in, and he left at midnight. And went on strike. Jerry became a very popular person because Jerry does a lot of barbecue competitions. 
And uh, I don't know if he ever shut that grill off in 20 days. <laughs> So he, you know, he had a big, a lot of commitment on that. Shelly Schaefer, also a steward at the plant, tireless leader on strike, seven days a week. Shelly walked the picket line and even brought all four of her children to many of those days. Now that's labor education, folks. That's labor education, like both President Shelton and David Woodfield. So I, I, I want to ask. For all of you to give these two, here's the, here's the people that did it. A round of applause. Thank you.